My name is Jesse Driscoll. I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego, School of Global Policy and Strategy. My co-author, Dominique Arell, and I have written through Cambridge University Press the book Ukraine's Unnamed War Before the Russian Invasion of 2022. Dominique is the Danny Lou Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa. I think the biggest takeaway for readers of the book is that we can't imagine settling this conflict over the heads of Ukrainians. It's a nation of 40 million people, and there's a lot of meaningful variation in that population. The people that Vladimir Putin thinks of as the Ruski Mir, the Russian speakers, the people who speak Russian at home, in his imagination, they should want to be Russian. They should want to be part of Mother Russia. They should want to, given the chance, exit the Ukrainian polity. The evidence that we present in the book is that in 2014 and 2015, given the chance, they absolutely didn't, not most of them. Russia believes that if it is a civil war, this is part of why they like the term, they should have a right to use the UN to settle it in their sphere of influence. No one else in the world and most people in Ukraine do not accept that interpretation of international law. Now, in the future, if we get a settlement that neither side wants and they use it, as an excuse to reconstitute their military power for a couple of years and then the war breaks back out again, that's not going to blow my hair back. That's a fairly typical way that interstate conflicts like this end, but then restart, and then end, but then restart. Both nations believe that their national interests, their vital interests, even their survival, certainly their security, are at risk. And those are the sorts of things worth fighting and dying for, for a lot of young men on both sides. So I don't see either nation as close to exhausting itself. And unfortunately, that means that the analogies are the Korean War, the Arab-Israeli wars, and those things go on and on and on, I'm sorry to say. In the short term, there are three urgent things that need to go on, and I like to break them down into military things, economic things, and sociological things. On the military side, uh, the Western nations need to make sure that Ukraine doesn't run out of ammunition. Ukrainians are doing all of the dying, but the weapons that they're using to defend their country need to continue to flow. And they need to flow from the American industrial base, but also Europeans need to step up a little bit more and provide a little bit more than has been thus far. Then there's economics, uh, which are also obviously tied to security, but we need to continue to send money so that the Ukrainian state can pay its bills, and we need to also think about rebuilding, and we need to also keep the sanctions on Russia as tight as possible. Then there's sociology, and in some ways this is where the most important kind of support is ongoing, but more is needed. What's ongoing is that Europeans outside of Ukraine have opened their countries to millions of refugees that have fled, often women with children, because men are still, by law, fighting in Ukraine. But what's going to happen to those families over the short and medium term is an open question. That's where a lot of the support is most necessary. And I think that this is a great moment for Europe in terms of how they've behaved thus far. I hope that continues.